you for a really excellent talk, sir. It's a great spot this morning. So, one unified theme seemed to be that it's important to do experimentation to get them there with these questions. And that seems to be a, a running into the problem, of course, that we are getting a more risk of our society. So, I wonder how can we actually enhance our abilities as a society to explore things, to actually try out, try out this new and uh, possibility, do a bit more trial and error without running into too many people worried about potential risks. Okay, uh, can we take another question? You mentioned, you mentioned uh, something about um, your uh, art project, uh, which involved something like one centimeter large cells or something like that. Um, you didn't quite um, explain that, so I would, I would like to know a bit more about that. And the uh, gentleman just there, four over back. Hi, uh, this is a question to Kevin Borwick. Um, I've read that the original people who experimented with the magnets, um, the magnet gets rejected after about a year. Uh, has this issue been solved? And if yes, then the work we get the magnet got. Yeah, first on the magnets, I mean, I think it is, if you're into experimentation at all, it's an excellent route. Yeah, the um, Todd Hoffman in, in Arizona, one of the pioneers in the field, uh, now I think the development um, of, of the coatings particularly and the type of magnets is such that they seem to be pretty inert. Jowish I showed there, his implant went in 18 months to two years ago. Uh, Ian, who has had his for about 15 months, and now the latest student for about three months, that, that we have no reactions that we can report on of a negative nature. They seem nice and settled and so on. There's issues to do with the sensitivity and how that changes over time, but that's a research <laughs> issue. But in terms of infection or the, the response mechanisms of the body for trying to reject the material, it, it, it seems to be pretty well developed now, so I, I think, and you can buy them online commercially, and if you want to know exactly from them, just send me an email and I'll send you some addresses and possibilities. You, you can get them within a, a short space of time, they're not difficult to get. Um, in terms of the risk counters, uh, I think in the medical world, there always have been a number of experimentations, and I do think um, Surgeon, there are a lot of surgeons who don't wish to experiment, but there are a lot of surgeons who are, because it, partly because it can help from a therapeutic point of view. I mean, I didn't show clips of the work we do with Parkinson's disease, but coming I mean, just down the road from you, John Radcliffe, Timbu Aziz, um, he's very much into trying to do different experiments that can help patients one way or another. But in doing so, it opens up new understandings of what we're doing. Working with Tipu, we're now using artificial intelligence to actually model part of the brain. So AI, in, in a sense, can outthink how parts of the, the human brain are thinking, which was not thought to be possible. But because of this work, we're actually getting signals from deep inside the brain through experimental purposes. There are issues with the, the work that I had with the implant, getting ethical approval, even with the, the magnets and the guy who's electrocuting his tongue, we know it's a bit strong to say, but we've had to get ethical approval. So yes, there is a paperwork trail to go through, which is unfortunate. I think it's appropriate to um, sort of filter the work that's going on. But in, in the end, it's down to individuals. You know, you, you Anders are in a position you could experiment, but you need to drive it forward. And you know, think about it. You you can actually try one, try the magnets, and see what it's like to report it. But it's down to you to do it, and that's what it comes down to. You know, Ray Kurzweil is a good friend of mine, and I will keep challenging him. All right, Ray, you talk about this. Try it. You know, have an implant. See what he hasn't yet, and I will keep goading him with it constantly and every time that I meet up with him. But I think it is down to individuals to push the envelope. So about the um, protocells, um, I won't go 
into a, a, a long explanation, but essentially the, the protocell system is uh, based on the chemistry of oil and water. So where oil and water meet, there is a lot of energy, and that is partly to do with the relationship of oil to water. It loves water on one hand, and it can't resolve the fact that it also hates water on the other hand. And so that when you actually look at, at kind of um, planes of um, oil molecules against um, a, a water interface, you get huge shifts of um, molecular activity um, when you get small disturbances in the, the, the baseline energy of that system. And you can harness that then to drive um, droplets, which you can think of as being embodied agents. And you can either have a water phase or an oil phase that works both way around. And you can actually use the droplets as carriers then for other forms of information. So in other words, the hardware, which is the squishyware, um, actually has a dynamism of its own based on the properties of oil and water. But then there is another level or series of levels of programming that exists over that when you actually start to create um, a, a carrier system, a bit like a depot injection in, in medicine where you give somebody a, a jab and that lasts for some months. So you can do that in, in that particular context. If you slow the system down, you get bigger cells. If you speed it up, you get smaller cells. So essentially it's a, a fine tuning of the relationship between oil and water and you can get lifelike emergent behaviours. Quick comment on the experimentation and risk. I'll refer to my own experience in the mobile phone industry. There are some companies that experiment regardless and they release a prototype stuff that isn't quite ready for the market and they struggle. And there are other companies that avoid risks like the plague and they say, well, we better not do this, that might just cause a problem, you know, we, it might slow down our project. And they tend to fail as well. So both the two extremes are inappropriate. You can't just embrace risk, you can't just avoid risk. For it to be successful in life, you have to manage risks. And I, I've, I've accepted a risk in my own life recently. I haven't implanted anything, but I have had my eyes lasered. And before I did have my eyes lasered, the doctor sat me down and said, well, here's all the risks. What do you think about it? And I said, yeah, it's a risk. And he said, well, actually, there's a one in six risk because of my particular prescription that the operation won't work quite right and I might need to have a top up uh, six months later. How do you feel about that? And I said, yeah, well, I'm not happy about it, but it's a one in six chance I'll accept it. And as some of you know, that turned out to be my case. So, I'm still seeing a bit of a blur of faces as I look out to the audience uh, and I have to go back in uh, another week's time for another microsecond blast of the laser to finish the job off. But I'm glad I took that risk and I think we need therefore to be very skilled at evaluating risks, quantitatively as far as possible, continually reviewing what the risks are, having people trying to kick tires in our projects but then at the same time thinking, well if that risk did have come about, how would we know about it quickly, how could we uh, uh, respond to it quickly and then we can make real progress. So, balance both sides. Thanks. Um, any more questions? In front row. Hello. This is a question for Kevin Warwick or anyone else who wants to comment. My question is, do you think in 50, 100 years or um, whatever it happens to be, um, the whole world will sort of be interlinked with a, a sort of a giant social network of telepathic brains through implant? Or do you think the social pressures against this will stop it from happening? Stop it happening. For example, I come from a high-tech community, and I'm not sure I know anyone who would have a voluntary brain surgery for the sake of getting telepathy or into the brain of someone else. I mean, they would say, "Look, I already have a cell phone. Why take that risk? Why?" Okay, and there's another question. Um, two questions way back. This one's for Kevin. You talk about uh, implanting your arm or something opposed to your brain. Does that, how does that feel? Is that different from just a feeling in your arm? And also, I think for about 100 electrodes, how much information can you get in those electrodes? Uh, 